my father and uncle, as some of you know, uh, had been victims of the McCarthy era and uh, even the pre-McCarthy period before World War II and had been <coughs> PhDs in history but had been blacklisted from teaching for many, many years. When I was growing up, my father was unable to get a job teaching in American universities. Later in the 60s, he was able to do it again because of their uh, accusation, because of accusations against them of being members of the Communist Party. Um, I mention this because growing up, I uh, therefore knew what many people of my generation, at least white people, um, took a long while to find out and discovered to their shock in the 1960s, which is that there was a very large gap that separated American ideals or professions of respect for liberty and uh, civil rights, etc., cetera, um, from, social, from the actual social and political reality of this country. The recognition of that gap suddenly hit the country with a tremendous force in the 1960s with consequences that everybody uh, is aware of, but this was because of my own particular background, uh, this was not any great surprise to me. Um, Gabor Borat, a uh, refugee from communist Hungary who, teach, who has become a leading Civil War scholar and teaches down at Gettysburg College, once said to me, um, talking about his upbringing in Hungary, he said, I was raised in a country where we understood that most of what the government says is untrue. And I said, that's funny, Gabor, you and I grew up in the same country. <laughs> um, so um, given uh, the fact that my father and uncle were both historians, it seems kind of, uh, in retrospect, inevitable that I would be a historian. But that was not the case, uh, at least in the beginning. As I always tell my students, events are only inevitable after they happen. And um, I actually wanted to be an astronomer when I was growing up. I went to college to uh, study astronomy and physics, and for two years I was an astronomy major, not a history major at all. But I did grow up, as I say, in a family where history and politics were uh, the common currency of dinner table conversations. And uh, only later did I realize that not all um, families in suburban America in the 1950s spent their dinner time discussing international politics, what was going on in Guatemala or France or India. Um, and um, particularly, of course, uh, the, um, the focus in, in the, just thinking about American life at that time, among all of these communist-oriented historians, was so much on the question of race. This is before the advent, really, of the Civil Rights Movement. But I grew up in a home in which <coughs> Um, well, Paul Robeson and W. B. Du Bois were friends of my family, and I just heard uh, ideas taken for granted today, but which were quite unusual, at least in the historical scholarship of that period, i.e. that slavery was the fundamental cause of the Civil War, that emancipation was the greatest uh, outcome of the Civil War, that Reconstruction was a tragedy, not because it was attempted, but because it failed, and that the condition of African Americans was the foremost domestic problem facing um, the United States. Um, so, as I say, I kind of grew up with some kind of just a, a by osmosis, learning many things that would later play a very important role in my uh, scholarship. The second um, uh, turning point, I guess, was when I went in the 1960s, early 60s, to study uh, as an undergraduate at Columbia University, and then when, as often happens, of course, to people going into history, I happened to take a course with a tremendously inspiring teacher, Jim Shenton, uh, which combined with my basic lack of ability in the science, uh, <laughs> convinced me to uh, become a historian. And um, looking back, I, I kind of realized that really there were two teachers who taught me pretty much whatever I know about teaching. One was my father, who, even though he wasn't able to actually teach in a formal way, gave a lot of freelance lectures on history and current affairs when I was growing up. And um, my father's lectures always connected the past and the present. In other words, how, if you're thinking in the McCarthy era, you have to think back to the days of the Alien and Sedition Acts, or maybe the repression of World War I how you couldn't understand the civil rights movement without knowing about the great struggles of the um, abolitionist movement. 
and how in the American occupation of the Philippines and the brutal suppression of Philippine independence around the turn of the, the 20th century, you could see the antecedents of American interventions in Guatemala and Vietnam and Iran, etc. And, and I also heard from him a, a kind of history in which people like Thomas Paine and Wendell Phillips and Eugene Debs were critical actors in American history as well as the presidents and Supreme Court justices, uh, etc. The second great teacher, as I said, was Jim Shenton, who was famous at Columbia to generations of students for his dramatic lecturing style, and also the tremendous concern he had for students, the personal interest, down to taking us out to dinner frequently at some of the uh, culinary attractions of New York City, and the kind of really genuine selfless concern for students that Shenton displayed was the best education I was meant to really be a teacher. And of course at Columbia I eventually also came to work with Richard Hofstadter, um, both as an undergraduate and later who supervised my doctoral dissertation. And Hofstadter really became my intellectual mentor. Um, and um, I, I guess, you know, I, I think that the kinds of questions that I tried to deal with in my historical writing are all are Hofstadter questions. The relationship between politics and intellectual life, uh, social movements and political thought, etc. The answers are very different, but the questions really remain the same. I mean, I'm always kind of thinking about how Hofstadter influenced the way I uh, think, uh, the way I think about history, but also, of course, the times in which I was living, whether it was how I grew up, but being a graduate student in the 1960s, uh, taking part in anti-war activities or civil rights activities at the same time that one was studying American history trying to write a dissertation, um, you know, just to drive home the point, which we're all aware of, of the constant interconnections between the historian's mode of thinking and the world in which we are uh, living. Um, the next turning point uh, was, and this should maybe be a source of hope to some people here, was not getting tenure. Um, I, my first job was at Columbia. After three years, they told me I wasn't going to get tenure and I ought to get out and look for another job. And this um, was actually a tremendous stroke of good luck, even though at the time I didn't see it that way, um, because City College, just up the road, had just hired Herbert Gutman to redevelop their history department, and Herb offered me a job, and so I moved 20 blocks from Columbia to City College, but it might as well have been on the other side of the moon as far as the differences between those two institutions were. It, it, City College then it was just going through open admissions, and the nature of the student body couldn't have been more different, obviously. This were the children of the working class of New York City, the <coughs> white ethnics, blacks, Hispanics, etc. Nearly all of them, the first in their families ever to go to a college. But, <coughs> Gutman, you know, it was there, really. Columbia's education had been very traditional, for which I'm very happy, grateful in a way. I mean, it was, Columbia was the center of political intellectual history with a capital P and capital I. Gutman was then pioneering what was then called the new social history. It's not that new anymore, obviously. But the, just the opening up of historical study that that uh, movement uh, created uh, and, and the, the ex tremendous expansion of the cast of characters of historical study was something I learned for a decade just working with him and, and seeing how he and the people he brought together, Leon Fink, Virginia Yans, others who were all at City uh, with me at that time. Um,